So we're coming out to the middle of November now and it's been about three and a half weeks since I started this lacto-fermented pickle. Let's have a look at it today. I think we're ready to put it into jars. So just having a look here, we can see that the vegetables have changed a little bit. They kind of look cooked, which is normal and natural for what's happening in here. So the bacterial processes that are fermenting this are actually almost kind of cooking those vegetables. That's what we wanted. I'm going to take that bag out of the top, which is the airlock, and I'm just going to have a sniff. Oh yeah. So that smells really nice and tangy and fizzy and acidic, which is good. It's looking nice and healthy. There's no mold or anything on the top there. There's no sort of mold or slime or anything like that. I'm going to get in there and try a couple of bits. So I'm going to have a bit of carrot, one of those big slices of carrot. Let's give that a taste. Mm, that's good. Wow. Salty, really tangy, slightly spicy because of those chilies we put in there. That's good. Yeah. And it's got that kind of kimchi funk to it. That's a piece of courgette, and you can see that's almost kind of looks like it's cooked. Hmm. Okay, um, and I think probably what I'm going to do is try one of those pieces of jalapeno, because these are kind of the star of the show. These are my homegrown chilies. Let's see what those are like. Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> nice little bit of fire, but juicy and pickled. So we're definitely ready to decant this into jars. So I'm gonna crack on with that. And now I'm gonna serve some of this for my lunch. Now look, just looking in the bottom of the bowl, it does look like it did overflow at some point. So that's good, just as well I had that bowl there. And then starting really with the largest jar, I'm just gonna pack a bunch of this in there and then cover it with the brine. And then once this is packed down, this is gonna go in the fridge. So this is a pickle for short-term preservation. So what we've aimed for here is something that's not too salty and fermented quite fast, so it went acidic quite fast, but the, the notion here is to produce a pickle that's still fairly fresh tasting, but also is for kind of short-term storage, which would be in the fridge. In terms of sterilizing the jars, really you've got to find your own comfort level for this. I have washed these very thoroughly with very hot water and then rinsed them with scalding hot water. I haven't baked them in the oven to sterilize them because the whole process is not sterile to start with. The pickle is a living thing and the bacteria in there are producing the acids. It's not like we've worked really hard to keep microorganisms out of here. They're part of the process. I'm just going to use a funnel to get some of these into the smaller jars. So I might just put smaller pieces in some of these. Now I'm going to top these off with the brine out of the liquid, but I want to get the solid bits in there and pack down first. I'm actually just going to taste. That's a piece of radish. It's lost its red colour. So some of the rainbow that we pickled has, has kind of disappeared into the brine. Mm. Just slightly crisp, but also got an interesting pungency to it. The aromas coming off here at the moment are pickling, acidity, garlic, onion, and that kind of funky fermented aroma that you get with kimchi, which is a bit like the smell of cheese, maybe. This jar's a bit heavier on the peppers just because of randomness, but that's fine. Now it's worth noting, that I'm not an expert at doing this lacto-fermenting pickling. This is only the third, maybe fourth time I've done this. So in the comments on the previous video, some people expressed concern about the salt level that I used in here. Yeah, I know. They said I didn't add enough salt. That thing again. Um, now, there are two competing schools of thought about this. And I wandered into the crossfire between the two of them. On the one hand, people say that you should add more salt because it guarantees safe preservation. On the other hand, people say you should add less salt because it guarantees that the thing will get lively and the bacteria will do the preservation. So I used a 2.5% brine solution, which didn't include the weight of the vegetables, which, and the vegetables do contain a fair bit of water. So some people think that's wrong. Other people say, no, that's fine. The only thing I can recommend really on this is do your own research. Research this thoroughly. 
and take advice from people who are obviously having success in doing it. So we've used a 2.5% brine solution. That will be more than adequate for pickling these vegetables because they're going in the fridge. If you wanted something that's going to be shelf stable and pickle and stand at room temperature, maybe you'd want to use a bit more salt, but you will end up with quite a salty pickle. This is actually quite salty, even though I only added 2.5% salt to the brine. Like I say, if you're going to do this, do your research and follow the advice of people who can clearly demonstrate success. I think the rest of that I'll probably just put in a plastic container and use it over the next couple of days. So there we go, pickled rainbows. Going to put those in the fridge and then we're going to do a proper tasting as part of a meal. Okay, to save the need to sterilise any more jars or clean any more jars, the rest of that is just going to go into a plastic storage container. And again, that's going to go in the fridge. And I'm just going to use that first. So this pickling brine contains a lot of lactic acid, which is the preservative in this process, as well as the salt. But that lactic acid is the acid that gives cheese its flavour, or one of its flavours. So I'm wondering if we can use some of this brine to make a kind of fake cheese sauce or something. We might have a go at that. Right, let's get some lunch together. We've just got some beautiful curly kale here that I'm going to take the midribs out. I mean, I could probably actually do that with my hands. So I'm just going to tear the midribs out of this kale because those will be a bit tough. Those can go in the stock box though. And then I'm going to shred this ever so nice and fine. Like that. And then we're going to stir fry it. So a little bit of hot oil in a pan. In goes the kale. I'm just going to wilt that down and it will kind of crisp up a little bit where it's frying. So we're kind of searing, toasting this kale. Which might seem like a weird thing to do, but I think it's going to be good. And now that that's started to cook, I've just got a bit of dark soy. So I'll just set that aside for one moment. Just give them a little white brown and a rinse. Same pan. Just going to dry off those moisture droplets. A bit more oil. And an egg. These are Burford Browns. Actually, the camera's not showing you how brown this egg is. This, these are Burford Browns. They've got spectacularly orange yolks. Let me just adjust the camera so you can properly see that's that's the actual colour of the yolk of that egg. I'm just going to cook that sunny side up while I prepare everything else. And here is everything else. I've just got some plain white rice here, which I've cooked. I like it a little bit sticky like this. My seared kale with soy. I'm going to have a nice generous spoonful of my fermented pickles on the side. And this is why I cut the pieces to the size I cut them, because this is about making this so it works in this dish. And finally, I've just got that egg. Yolk is still nice and runny. We'll have that on top. So that's lunch. Let's get that to the table. Give it a taste. OK. Now, one thing I am curious about, and I don't think I've actually come across it yet. Here's a piece of the this is the butternut squash. Now, this went in raw. Every, all of the vegetables went in raw. But I wonder what the texture of this is going to be like. That was good. Hmm. Really odd, but because it, it's almost like it's cooked, but it's still crisp. So it's got the texture of almost like pear on the peak of ripeness. Really good. Anyway. So. So a little bit of this fermented pickle, some egg, some of that kale and some rice. Here we go. Let's give that a try. Mm. That's actually a really, really tasty combination. And of course, I didn't invent this combination. This is a, this is kind of, I have taken some inspiration from Asian dishes here, obviously. So not claiming to have invented this combination. This is obviously something that will be quite familiar to some people, I'm sure. Yeah, see, pieces like that, so that's a piece of that enormous carrot we had. Pieces like that, fun as they are, 
are kind of a bit difficult to manhandle with a fork and spoon. Something went on the floor then. The carrot's really nice because it's crisp. In fact, all of the vegetables have done this. They've gone crisp, but soft. Some pieces of chili pepper in that, in that lot. Let's try that. Mm. Yeah, really good. So I am very pleased with the result of that experiment. It's a really good combination, this, because that kale is still, even though that kale is quite toasty, it's still quite green and crisp. And the rice would be just boring without these other things with it. So, yeah, this is a, it's a winning combination. So that's all well and fine, but that was really just boiled rice with vegetables and an egg. Let's do something a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to revisit the same recipe. I've got this, which is some Polish cured pork, essentially bacon, smoked cured pork. And I'm going to cut this into sort of half centimeter slices. That might be more like three quarters of a centimeter. So maybe like seven millimeters slices or something. Something like that. Nice thick slices. Now this is quite fatty, but that's okay because that fat is going to render out and that's going to be the fat that we use to cook all the other elements of the dish. And then I'm going to cut these into little sticks of about the same thickness. So I'm going for something like that. So the idea of this is that the fat is going to render out of that and leave something behind that's crisp but still not hard like pork scratchings. Okay, I'm just going to spread that out so it's all in contact with the pan and it will start sizzling any moment. Meanwhile, we'll prepare a few other ingredients. So just a small onion, and I'm gonna cut that into just little strips like that. So you can see the fat coming out of this bacon and it's starting to crisp up a little bit on the surface. I'm just going to go really gentle with this because I want that to gently render out. I don't want to just seal the outside. Right, I feel like that's about halfway there now. So we're going to put the onions in. And while those are cooking down, we'll just prepare the next ingredient, which is again, curly kale. I love this stuff. So just tear the leafy bits off the tough midribs. And again, I'm gonna bring that into a bunch and then cut it into little shreds. That's not gonna go in until a little bit later when the bacon is nearly done. Now also for this, I've got some rice that I cooked yesterday and chilled down straight away. Rice is one of those things where people say you shouldn't reheat it. And there's a bit of truth to that. If you cook rice and then leave it out at room temperature for a long time, it can foster the growth of Bacillus cereus, which is a significant food poisoning pathogen. And so some people get sick from eating rice that's been reheated, but the cause was not the reheating. It was the fact that the rice was improperly stored before it was reheated. I haven't done that here. I cooked this rice, I chilled it down really fast and put it in the fridge. So it's not had a chance for that bacterial growth to happen. So reheated rice in that context, perfectly safe to use. Meanwhile, you see how this bacon has taken some color now and it's caramelized on the outside, but not every side. So I'm just gonna keep on moving it around. So each side of the bacon pieces gets a chance to crisp up or as near as possible. Quite a lot of fat going on in here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to, I may use all of this fat because it is just food, but I think I'm going to skim some of it off because it may prove useful later. So I just moved everything to the side of the pan and you can see I've managed to create a kind of puddle of fat over that side. And so this fat, I will just reserve some of this because we might use that in a later part this cooking. I don't think we need it all right now. So I've just got about a tablespoon of that fat reserved here in a separate pot. Onions have caramelized a little bit. Bacon, I would say, is about as crisp as I want it to be. 
bearing in mind it's going to cook a little bit further when we put the rest of the ingredients in. So now the kale. And that will spit a little bit because it was still residual water there from when I washed it. And just toss that around a little. So the kale's gone from kind of dull green to bright green. And what I'm looking for now is a transition back to a kind of dark green. So as soon as I start to see bits of that, which I'm seeing a little bit of there, a bit of it jumped out there. Let's just eat that, chef's privilege. So I'm starting to see it go to dark green now, and that's good. So time for the rice. I reckon about that much rice, so about half of my cooked rice. I'm going to turn that down a bit. It's now starting to crisp up a little bit. I'm going to make a little hole in the middle here. Turn down the heat a bit, and that fat from the bacon earlier goes back in. And now a couple of eggs into there. And I'm not going to stir these into the rice, but I am going to just kind of loosely break them up a little bit. The idea is I'm going to cook a kind of scrambled eggs in the middle here and then stir that through the rice. Now you could stir it into the rice. You could stir it through and you'd get egg coated rice. But I want kind of little chunks of omelette almost in this fried rice. That's looking good. Okay, that's good. So I'm going to break that up and now stir it through. And then of course the... Oh, Eva, come on. Eva! Eva! And then, and then of course the ingredient that we actually came here for, which is my pickles, and a little bit of the juice, but not too much. So just going to throw in these pickled vegetables. I might, might as well use the rest of this. So this has got my garlic and my chilli and the vinegary, well it's lactic acid, the acidity of the pickling liquor. So there's a lot of seasoning already in here, in here including of course salt. So there we go. And I think we'll just have a little bit of that pickle juice as well. Now give that a little stir. I don't think there was quite enough of that pickle in there, so I'm just going to break into the next jar. It looks a bit of a mess, but let's get that served up and give it a taste. And I think I'm just going to finish that with a little bit of crispy onion. Just for some texture and flavour interest. All right, let's get that to the table and give it a try. I'm not sure whether I should actually admit this, but this is breakfast today, because I thought, why not? Let's see what that's like. Mm. Oh, that's really, that's really nice. So those bits of bacon, which were initially quite fatty, have rendered down. And they're now meaty and ever so slightly crisp. And the fat from that bacon has coated everything here and the acidity of these pickles cuts through that fat making it just really nice to eat so there we go that's a kind of egg fried rice style thing made with my rainbow pickles so the way these flavors are balanced if i may say so myself is really superb the kale gives it a kind of fresh edge the bacon is sort of mellow and smoky and comforting the acidity of the pickle cuts right through the fattiness of the bacon and that little tang of spice and acidity from the pickle just seasons the whole dish. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. So I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.